Kevin Green at Caroline Woods, our senior markets correspondents. Uh, all right, so uh, we've spent a lot of time today talking about 50-day moving averages and such. I'm ready to get to some earnings. It's earnings season. It officially begins. United's numbers are out. Their capacity is up 9%. I do think that's a pretty good figure right out of the bat uh, because the whole question we talked about this morning uh, was whether or not these – airlines are able to provide the travel that everyone's demanding, uh, providing seats, providing pilots, providing planes whose parts do not fall off. Am I wrong, Caroline? <laughs> <laughs> Well, United's had quite a few mishaps in that department because of those Boeing planes. Oh, so yeah. I, I, I'm interested to hear the commentary on this earnings call. But just from initial glance here, looks like investors are happy with these earnings. Shares are up uh, in, in the aftermarket about 5%. Um, in, in terms of revenue, that rose nearly 10%, 9.7% to $12.5 billion. The expectation was for $12.43 billion. So easy beat there. You talked about capacity being up 9.1%. I'm seeing an, uh, a loss of $0.38 cents per share. We, we figured United was going to be swinging to a loss because of the, this Boeing overhang especially. Um, I want to make sure that's the adjusted figure because the expectation was from the street was for a loss of $0.53 cents per share. So that looks like a beat on the bottom line as well. You know, we heard from Delta last week. They talked about that uptick in corporate travel and uptick in or the, you know, the strong international travel. We figured United would benefit from that as well. Seems like that's definitely the case, seeing as they have outsized exposure to both. A guidance is going to be key here. I don't actually see it yet. I was going through this report, but I know that Q2 Guidance is going to be closely watched because Q2 of 2023 is going to provide some tough comps because they were reporting record EPS. So the number to look for, um, Wall Street's looking for $3.73 per share for Q2 guidance and then $9.43 per share for uh, full year guidance for EPS. So want to make sure that uh, you want to see how those compare. But based on uh, what we're seeing, actually, yeah, it looks like I'm seeing about a 4% gain right now on these on these numbers so yeah. it seems like investors are impressed at least thus far not bad after our discussion this morning kg how did these uh, numbers line up to your expectations and what analysts were looking for yeah, definitely. I mean, the expectations were fairly low and they were able to exceed that. Caroline was actually talking about the guidance moving forward. They're looking for the next quarter to have adjusted earnings per share to come in between three or adjusted profit to come in between three dollars and seventy five cents and four dollars and twenty five cents. Street was looking for three dollars and seventy six cents. So the guidance moving forward was also really good. A couple of things to also note, you talked about the increase in capacity. That's their availability or their ability to uh, provide seats to customers, if you will. Right. But their load factor, which is how much their fleet is actually filled to capacity is sitting at around 80 percent so they still have some upside there which is probably why we saw that revised guide to the upside they believe that the trends for the consumer uh, when it comes to travel may continue to increase and they may not have to bring additional capacity on they're able to utilize what they have right now the other thing to also note too when it comes to their fleet i just had it up here it does appear that they did adjust uh their their um their aircraft if you will when it comes to what they're going to be receiving here in in the near term from um, from Boeing, uh, it does appear that they're going to adjust from the the Max Nines, Max Tens to the Max Eights or Max Nines if needed, based on the Boeing issue that is out there. So that readjustment is also going to impact their forward guidance well out into the future once they actually receive this fleet as to the capacity that they can uh, manage for their customers as well. So I thought that was very interesting, kind of trying to diversify their fleet, if you will, instead of trying to go for, um, uh, you know, an airplane that has had some issues here in the, in the near term. Well, you literally just reminded me, I forgot, I have a great tweet drafted from my travel plans yesterday where I was trying to pick a flight and I was on American and one of them was 737 Max and then an hour later was the Airbus. And uh, my tweet is, which one should I go for? I think I'm going to go with the Airbus. I think these things actually matter. I think it's starting to really make a difference. Uh, you know, people have wisened up, and now we're publishing, you know, these things more uh, clearly, I see, on travel itineraries and plans. And if you are an airline who has been in the headlines, then you've got a lot of – you don't have, like, Boeing-level justification and work cut out for you, Caroline, but you do have, I think, some proving to do. Patriotic of you, Oliver. But yes, I think that. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you. I'll find I have never checked. Planes. <laughs> if, the, you know, who, if the French want to make planes that fly, parlez-vous. I'll go. <laughs> 
Well, I think that that Boeing overhang is definitely going to be key on, on this call as well because we know they had to delay two international routes because of it. We know that they delayed their their uh, investor day on May 1st, or they postponed it because of it. So I think there are probably going to be a lot of calls from analysts about the impact of, of that. And, and just also the FAA safety review, given all of those mishaps that they've been, um, they've been having to go through right now. So I do think that, um, you know, maybe I, I should start paying a little bit closer attention to, <laughs> to the planes that I'm flying on. I usually just pick whatever's cheapest. Yeah, yeah. well, uh, actually, the prices were no different for me, so that was kind of the, the equalizer. Um, all right, so look, you've got fuel prices going up. You've got a plane maker that's having trouble making planes. Um, you've got pilots and uh, labor that has been a little bit spotty the last year. I, I guess this is pretty good, all things considered, that they're able to put out uh, numbers like this and uh, a particularly a profit guidance ahead of expectations so do we give them credit for that kg yeah definitely and when you're looking at their portfolio mix or their mix between international travel and domestic travel that's where their tailwind is happening right now international travel is a lot more profitable and we continue to see that ramp up on a week by week basis if you're looking at tsa data so i think that's also going to be a tailwind for them and then when you're looking at the uh business travel continues to rise on an incremental basis so uh compared to some of their peers uh, they actually have a, a pretty decent leg up here uh, if we are going to continue to see these trends moving forward. Now, there is going to be that risk of fuel costs, as you kind of talked about here. Uh, but if we are at our near-term peak when it comes to fuel and we start seeing that move back to the downside then, then that's going to also uh, improve their margins. So I think this is actually a really good report. did surprise me when it came to their guidance. I thought that was a little bit more bullish than I would have expected to come out from United. And I think we have to give them credit for that. Let's see if they are able to sustain these gains in the after hours. All right. Uh, Carolina, last thought on United, and then we'll check out some J.B. Hunt. Uh, from planes to trucks. Well, I've, I've already moved on to right, J.B. Hunt. All right, let's do it. Let's go. I, just because this is, a pretty, this is a pretty big miss here, so I wanted to see what we're seeing. Yeah, and it looks like they're going to get punished for Ooh. it. Uh, this is a miss on both the top and bottom line. If you take a look, adjusted EPS came in at $1.22. The expectation was for $1.53. Uh, so big miss there. Revenue, meanwhile, fell 9%. So United saw a 9.7% increase. J.B. Hunt, is uh, revenue fell 9% to $2.94 billion. The expectation was for a revenue decline, but uh, Wall Street was expecting more like $3.12 billion. So big miss there. We know back in January, CEO John Roberts said the freight environment remains in a challenged state. Seems like that continues to be the case with retailers and manufacturings pulling back, manufacturers, of course, pulling, pulling back to deal with some of the bloat that they were experiencing. There's, you know, uh, companies like this are dealing with rising costs in terms of labor, materials, and equipment. And then they're also facing pressure from customers and competitors when it comes to prices. And it seems like that's definitely playing out. I think analysts were starting to get a little bit uh, you know, more cautious on this name heading into this report. I did see a downgrade from Barclays a couple weeks ago and then some price targets trimming. Overall, they're still pretty positive on this one, uh, but doesn't seem like it's going to be the case after these results. They were already down about 8% heading into uh, this report year to date, uh, with the majority of that coming from this month. And it looks like those losses are going to continue. Okay. Yeah, GBH uh, falling short here. Uh, maybe a little bit of supply chain uh, disruption or maybe just JBH problems. I mean, they're uh, a major kind of indicator that I do like to watch. I feel like they go underappreciated as kind of a gauge of cycles for maybe the old school economy. But uh, I guess we've been in the new school thinking all about AI. I don't know if JB Hunt's going to matter. What do you think, Kevin? You know, this is actually a really good gauge as to the uh, the shipping industry as a whole when you're looking at intermodal and, and freight. And so when you're looking at every single segment, they've all of them missed. Uh, but one thing that actually is very interesting to see is the transcontinental network load actually increased by 5%. So when you're looking at intermodal, their problem that they've had over the last couple of quarters is that they're not able to pack the trucks um, <laughs> enough to be able to make it scalable. Mm. So they yeah. have business, but they just don't, they don't have the scalable business right now. If you have a little bit of a lesser load or you only have 80% of that truck uh, being um, you know, filled, then once again, you're kind of eating that cost. 
it does also appear when you're looking at the um, the final mile services. Check this out. When you're looking at the final mile, their revenue completely just fell off the map here, Oliver. I think you're also seeing Amazon and maybe some of these other uh, logistical companies that are really taking a, a lion's share of their business right now. And they've been trying to get new contracts and they highlight that. They implemented new contracts for pricing and trying to increase pricing to offset some of these losses. But what also comes with that is losing customers. And I think that's another way, area where they are uh, severely missing. Last thing I will say, integrated capacity solutions business saw segment volume decrease 22% on a year over year basis, and that is not sustainable. So overall, this is not a good report to say the least, but I will be interested to see on the conference call if they mention any bright spots, and this is an unfortunate situation, but any bright spots coming out of the uh, situation that occurred in Baltimore with that port being down, uh, and that could actually raise freight rates across the board, across the country, uh, to say the least. So that actually could be a tailwind for them. It's an unfortunate one to say the least, but their guidance and their commentary might actually allude to that. And that's where I think the value of this earnings announcement is going to come in at. All right. Uh, Caroline, I'll let you close this out. What do you think? I, you know, I read a stat this morning. I wish I had it. I think it was from FactSet. And they said of the 10% of S&P 500 companies that had reported Four, or of the companies that have reported, four out of five surprise to the upside. And a company like J.B. Hunt definitely is going to be skewing those, uh, those stats because this is the first big miss that at least I've seen yeah. so far of earnings season. So uh, kind of a disappointment here. Not a great start uh, for that industrial supply chain category, but hasn't been one that we've been terribly obsessed with in this market uh, for a while. We've been super tech heavy. Uh, even with the airline story, it's like I feel that that too, the expectations have gotten pretty low there. But uh, definite miss from uh, JBHT and a pretty good beat on the guidance from UAL. So we've got kind of one up and one down this afternoon. All right, well, we're off to the races. There we go. We just, you know, we got to pack more into our trucks, I guess. Uh, thanks, Caroline. <laughs> And Kevin Green, we got to pack some more into our planes too.